Welcome everyone. I'm Colonel Mike Bell, Executive Director of the Museum's uh, Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And uh, of course, this weekend would not be possible without our speakers, our attendees, and of course our sponsors. So uh, we take a moment uh, for special recognition goes to our presenting sponsor, Hancock Whitney. So let's give Hancock Whitney a round of applause. And, and consistent with uh, museum uh, tradition, uh, are there any uh, World War II veterans, home front workers, Holocaust survivors that are in the audience today? Well, and, and if they're really shy, let's, in honor of them, let's give them a round of applause and thank them. <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd also like to recognize uh, any uh, active duty military or veterans in the audience, uh, would you please stand uh, so we can recognize you as well. Thanks all of you for your service and, and uh, we know though that your service required support and so, uh, family members of veterans, how about if you stand so we can thank you for what you've done to make all this possible. So this afternoon, we have a special session before we kick off tomorrow. Uh, and what, what I've really learned in this, uh, in my nine months of living here in Louisiana is, is something called lanyap. I probably said that wrong, but it's a little something extra special that's added on top. And today what that is is boot camp basics. And I'm really excited about uh, this little special extra that we have today uh, to give you this glimpse of that. So what we'll hear about is how on every level the team behind Band of Brothers wanted to make uh, that uh, series as authentic as possible. You know, much as we see in the museum itself is how do we have that, that sense of authenticity. So to moderate the session, we've called upon not just a critical figure in the production of Band of Brothers, but also a dear friend of the museum. Kirk Sadusky has been an executive producer, an executive and producer at Playtone for 23 years. Is that long? Uh, in addition to Band of Brothers, he was responsible for uh, John Adams, uh, David McCullough, a painting with word, The Pacific, He Has Seen War, and Game Change. So a pretty impressive uh, set of accomplishments uh, that Kirk has, has worked behind the scenes, uh, even if, if you weren't aware of it. And, and what you'll see soon is the upcoming Masters of the Air about the B-17s and the air campaign over Europe. Kirk was also co-executive producer on CNN's Decades uh, series, as well as the network's The Movie. As I mentioned, he's a friend of our museum and has served as a presidential counselor here since the advisory board's inception in 2006. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kirk Sadusky and the panel to the stage. responsibility for some of those uh, projects but but thank you very much um, this is thank you, welcome to the uh, long delayed beginning of the 20th um, the, the 20th anniversary uh, reunion for band of brothers I know most of you will be here tomorrow, so we're not going to go into too much depth about what it all meant and, and the 20th anniversary of it. We will, but it is interesting. We were talking earlier that um, on we 
premiered on September 9, 2001. We know what happened two days later. And what that meant was for two months of Sundays, um, the American people and the world really would, could tune into HBO each Sunday night for two months, as I said, and see what America was capable of, who was best in America, what was best about America. So that's a big part of what we all realize why this, um, this show has been so successful. And again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. One of the, um, one of the legendary parts of Band of Brothers was the boot camp. And it was, uh, it, it, that started, the concept started on Saving Private Ryan and Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. We continued it on Band of Brothers, we did it with on the Pacific, and we did it recently in Masters of the Air. It, then those have become, those, those sessions, those week-long sessions have become legendary. And of course they were conducted and what's common about them all is they were conducted by another legend, Captain Dale Dye. We did a session earlier this morning with uh, active duty, uh, active duty uh, service members as well as other veterans, and somebody remarked about authenticity as a hallmark of our series. And he was exactly right. We explained why. And as as, as you get, you'll, as you'll see, one of the main reasons, one of the the um, main reasons that it seems so authentic, is because our guys, our guys were drilled, and they're, they'll they'll tell you about it. But that was part of the authenticity. How would they, how could they bear themselves as soldiers? How could they carry themselves so that it would be be believable, not just to the wide audience, but to the men who actually did it. So without any further ado, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves and then just let them have a conversation. Captain Dye, would you start? Hi, folks. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Kirk, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming by to hear whatever it is we're going to say here. I have no idea. Uh, but, um, you know, we hear an awful lot about boot camp. And here's a couple of veterans right here, Ross McCall and Frank John Hughes, and the really, th and Mike Cudlitz, sorry. Um, and, and those guys are veterans, and they'll, they'll tell you how it all went down, and they're lying every bit of it, believe me. <laughs> Uh, but most important to me, of course, is my executive officer, Lieutenant Mike Stokey, who's right here. Woo -hoo. Uh, Mike's, Mike's been with me for 50 years, uh, believe it or not. We were both young corporals together in Vietnam, uh, and I was able to Shanghai him into this process, and he's been my good right hand forever. And I, we've got two of my finest platoon sergeants here. Uh, Freddie Joe Farnsworth is right over there. And Laird McIntosh is, is right next to him. So we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get to what you probably want to know in, in a very short uh, bit of time. But you heard Kirk make uh, some reference to uh, how well we did all of this, and Lord knows you've heard every boot camp story there is probably. But the real key, the real thing that made Band of Brothers what it is, didn't have anything to do with us. It had to do with those folks right down there. We, I got, we inherited the most astounding, extraordinary cast of young actors that I have ever encountered. And it's impossible to build what we were trying to build without their buy-in, and they did. They bought into it, they stayed into it for the nine months that we were over there trying to do it, and the real gift that Band of Brothers gives us is, is directly responsible, they're directly responsible for it. Uh, an extraordinary bunch of guys, and thank you all for giving us, me and the cadre one of the greatest experiences of our lives. Thank you, Dale. I'm going to sure. ask um, 
Mike and Ross and Frank to introduce themselves and tell us the characters that they portrayed. Mike, can you start? Hey guys, uh, Michael Cudlitz. I played or had the honor of portraying uh, Denver Randleman in the series. Hello, uh, Ross McCall. I played Joseph Liebgott in the series. I'm um, Frank John Hughes, and I played Wild Bill Garnier. So as I mentioned, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna, we just wanna hear what these guys have to say about this unique experience. The first thing I'm gonna ask the three of you is, when, d when did you first hear that you didn't just sign on to this big miniseries and Tom Hanks and Playtone and all of that, but you're gonna have to go to boot camp? Tell, tell us about how, how did that work? What did you think when you got that word? Um, I, I, had, I had heard it, uh, I auditioned about five times till the final audition. I, it was loosely mentioned in the first. There could be a boot camp a couple of days, you know, you run around in an army uniform or something. And as we kept passing each hurdle, the, the, the gravitas of a boot camp experience started to set in until the final audition that we had. Um, it was the only thing guys were talking about. If you get this, we're going to boot camp. Like, what's that going to be like? It started, there, there's some fear started to set in, you know, and uh, we all do realized you, we got it. Do you remember, do we, we all got, we're in the middle of this process. We're not even in the middle of this. We're beginning the process, and we get in the mail. We get drafted. That's right. That's you, right. You that's will right. report to. We're like, what the hell is this? This is from this guy. <laughs> That's right. The whole thing it, it by was design. It was from dated day in one, the forties. You was were, dated. you were, you were, we were drafted, and we we had to report. So anything that that the captain and and the cadre could put into this experience to make it feel as real as possible was done for us because we were like, yeah, we're doing a we're doing a series with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, and he's like, no, you're reporting to boot camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I remember my father had served in Vietnam, and he, when he got drafted, he got the one-way token to Fort Dix. And that letter, Mike, that, that felt like a little version of the one-way token. And that's when it kind of... And then I made a terrible mistake. I had gotten Captain's number. And uh, I had been training, and I called Captain, and I said, Captain, my name's Frank John Hughes. I'm playing Bill Garnier. And uh, any advice you can give me about what I can do to prepare for boot camp... And he said, a CO never gives his plan away to a grunt like you. I'll tell you, I'm going to put you through a sausage grinder. You're going to come out one fine effing soldier. And he hung up on <laughs> <laughs> That was the end of it. And it just got worse. It got worse from there. <laughs> got worse from there, yeah. R Ross, what do you, uh, what do you recall? I, I remember getting the very same letter in the mail, uh, you know, and here I am, a, a Scotsman living in England, um, playing an American soldier. And so I knew I had my work cut out. Um, and I got the letter from Captain. It was dated in the 40s. Uh, and it said, um, uh, I'm going to screw it up, obviously, but it said, uh, you could only bring a towel that was green, army green, which I thought was the strangest request. Uh, no reading material other than religious reading material. And you could bring a pencil and a piece of paper. And I was like, what the hell am I getting involved with? I, you know, I'm... Uh, my car's picking me up in two minutes, and when I'm going to the studio, I'm, I'm an actor. You know, somebody's going to make me a cup of tea, right? <laughs> it all stopped. It all stopped as soon as we got out of that car, and we all met up at Hatfield. And uh, I think the first person to scream in my face was this man, right back here, my Sergeant Freddie Joe Farnsworth. And there's a, a great picture Frank just sent to me recently, and it's, a, I think, the first picture we were ever in together. And we just met one another. And we both had this kind of grin on our face, like, ah, this will be fun. This guy came over, screamed at us, made us do push-ups, like, within the first 30 seconds of meeting him. And I was like, oh, boy, we are in for a ride. <laughs> Freddie, do you have a response to that? You know, I, I just hated them all. <laughs> <laughs> they all had to earn our respect, and they did. Um, Captain, why don't you explain what the pr what the process was? What were these guys? What were you, what did you have in mind for them? What were you and your team going to put them through, and and why? Well, 
the thing that I had always felt was missing from military movies, and the reason I got into it to begin with, uh, look, you can, you can do all in the world you need to with resident experts to get the uniforms right and the weapons right and that sort of thing, but that, that isn't really what I wanted to do. What I thought was missing was how we think, how we feel, what's in our guts, what's in our hearts. And there's only one way to experience that. I have to put you in that situation and build that unit. And if you, it, it's like Tinker Toys. If you, if you plug them in right, the machine suddenly builds, like an erector set, and, uh, or an erection set, I'm not sure which one. <laughs> At any rate, um, so what, that was what, that's what I had in mind, was, was building this unit, building the unit so that they would honor the men that we were trying to portray. And there are tricks to that trade. There are ways to do it. Um, it, it, it is certainly full immersion, and nobody's going to make him a cup of tea or anything else. Uh, but you have to live that lifestyle. You have to design it so that they live it. And then, because of the good little actor sponges they are, it's like pouring a water on, and they soak it up. And as they soak it up, they essentially begin to understand it. And, and we had a tradition, I think, uh, which is probably one of the most valuable things we did. Every evening, usually before chow, if they hadn't pissed me off that day, and then if they had, they didn't eat, but um, we would have a thing called stand down. And stand down was the one point during the day when they could ask me anything in the world they wanted. And we wouldn't stop answering until they felt they really understood that. And, and that's where their talent comes in. They would ask me the damnedest questions. Um, but you, if you just keep at it and you keep trying to answer that question, you keep trying to, to scratch that itch that they're feeling. Uh, and then what happens is the unit builds itself. The unit works that way. Mike, maybe you can help, help us understand what it is, what, what, Explain or describe a typical day in boot camp. How, from sun up to sand, sand town. Actually, I'm, that's why you gave me that. Can you? Yeah. Actually, I brought uh, a copy of a boot camp uh, uh, schedule, which is uh, for these gentlemen about a little short of two weeks. We also trained the Germans before then. What we learned um, after band was to train them both together so that they could, they could interact together and battle together. But um, there's an element here. These men are not conscripts. They're actors. They're individuals. Uh, they're edgy. They're rebellious. And we come along, and we've got a group of regimental make them the same, knock all that crap out of them. And that doesn't happen overnight. And um, at the end of the day, when it does happen, they become individuals, individual soldiers. But they have to go through a whole rites of passage where one day one of the men has had enough and fails, and somebody picks them up. And uh, toward the eighth or ninth day, it's that kid that failed, or was just, as I say, had enough, that picks the other guy up again. So it's quite a, uh, an alien theater for them. And we've had no better experience than with this group. And they became, by playing these heroes, they became their own band brothers, which is the proudest uh, tribute uh, to us. And um, J.L. Captain Guy and I have got reunions going back to Vietnam every couple years, and there's always a couple couple people that uh, glue, keep it together. And it was Garnier, Frank, and Randleman, Michael Cutlass, that uh, kept us alive every single year until COVID, we got together. And it's a tribute to them. But they, they are a group of band brothers now. Let's let's pursue that a little bit because not um, most people wouldn't know. But from that point, when you all gathered for the first session of boot camp, from that point till today, you guys really have been your own 
your own version of Easy Company. And one of the, what Mike was referring to is that um, the actors have had a reu ha have reunions and did have reunions every year until 2020 and COVID. There were, there, I, I know the last number of them have been at Mike's house. Why don't you guys tell, tell everybody what that's like and why did you decide like this wasn't enough boot camp and then and, and being in England for a year wasn't enough? Please tell us about that. I had, I had heard that um, Bill played a big part in keeping the company together post-war. That he kept the roster, he sent the emails, he helped plan the, the uh, reunions. It was a real big part of Bill's life when I knew him. It was, he took it very seriously. By memory, he could tell you every man's address in the company. I would mention someone's name and he'd go, yep, Smokey Gordon, and he'd just rattle off his address in his zip code. It was that important to him, so I felt like We've just been through a transformational experience. We should try to keep this together. And I brought it up to Mike, and Mike was in a great central location. He had the right house. He had the right location that was, everyone can get to. And that's how it started. And then um, Mike hosts him, and we've tried to keep the family, too, because there's a lot of support group around the family, you and every, everybody, and a lot of people that we have to have here today that we keep them part of this company, too, even if they didn't go to the you know, boot camp or in the show, they were, they were part of this process. The re, uh, I was gonna say the real Easy Company, but um, Easy Company had reunions, I think, be, starting in 1946, I think, was their first reunion, and they had them, I think, every year up until fairly recently for obvious reasons. And their reunions in also included extended families, as I'm looking at Bill Garnier's son. Um, and so, and I think Mike and Frank and, and the guys, their reunions have become extended families and they're, we're honored enough to be invited every year. And because it is, it, it's not just them, but it's all of us who participated and it really is another family reunion. Um, Dale, the, we, I mentioned earlier that uh, Saving Private Ryan, I think was the first time that this kind of thing had been attempted. Is that, is that correct? You tell me. What would, when, give us the history of this, this kind of experience. <laughs> no, negative. Uh, no, this, this really came about uh, with Platoon. Uh, Platoon was the first time I was given 33 actors and, and able to take them into the jungle full isolation for three weeks. And, uh, and that's what proved, it was kind of the, the proof of the project to me. It, will this work with actors? The answer is yes, it will. Um, and it works particularly good with good actors. Um, and I had them uh, in Platoon and then Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, and on and on and on. I think 50, 51 projects now or something like that. Wow. So, yeah. Well, as I said, legendary, so. Um, was there, did you guys ever have a moment, and for this, for the three of you guys, was there a moment when you did say, what am I doing this for? You know, as you said, where's my cup of tea? I, was there ever a moment when you had to face that? Uh, for, for me, no. Um, I, I, I got how important this show was. At the, a lot of people have asked me and asked us all, did you know how big this show was going to be and how important it was? And many of the guys say no. It took them by surprise. I, I took it, every, every man involved in this project took it so seriously, took the legacy seriously that... Um, going into boot camp was actually a joy. I hate to say that in front of these guys because they'll probably make me do it again at some point. But um, We'll change that next yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was also the, it was the genius, the, the reason Band and other shows, but particularly Band, worked so beautifully is that bond that was created between the gents. Uh, and that all comes from boot camp. So that was, if that was Mr. Spielberg, Mr. Hanks, Captain Die, the cadre, Tony Toe, Meg Lieberman, who cast the project, put a certain group of men together to create a bond. And I firmly believe that that was all on purpose. Um, and what boot camp did was it united us all, but even on the technical side of the show, it would mean we would know how to reload if we ran out of ammo, right? You wouldn't have to stop filming and have somebody come in and a stunt guy do your job for you. We just knew what to do. We knew how to reload. We knew how to, if our weapon jammed, we knew how to get out of that situation. But that bond that was created right at the beginning is what makes the show so powerful. 
And that's what leads into the reunions. That's, I mean, there is a real, real brotherhood here, but it's about the legacy of the men and it's something that we've all held close. So I knew going into boot camp straight away, I would, there would be no complaining coming from me. And in fact, I didn't hear a complaint from anybody. Mike, would, do you ever have a moment? Yeah, I was just gonna say that it's, what, what's kind of crazy and universal about what they put us through is there's this element that we always say we, we got a taste of what the men might have gone through. We have an idea of what they may have gone through. And, and for us, that's enough to grab onto. But this, this breaking down of a, it, of a, of a group is, is what they do in boot camp, in an actual boot camp. They take a longer time, they break you down further. It's what you go through in Hell Week in football. You get broken down and that, that you hold each other together because it's the end goal is something that you all love. So there's this, in the core of all of this, what, what the captain and these men have done is they've taken that idea of the, of the breaking down and, the, and the, you know, us finding a common enemy, because nothing bonds you together like a common enemy. And they've taken that and tailored it into a tool for us to use. Because I don't know if anyone knows or everyone knows, the, it was, we showed up as a group of, of privates and you know, three days into it, it's like, uh, sorry, Captain, I, I don't, I don't understand what you're, what you're doing here with the platoon. But you better understand, goddamn it, because it, you're in charge now. Get him up the hill, Sergeant. And you're like, what the hell? And all of a sudden, you're in charge, and you don't. There's, I, you can't ask that. Or you, you pull him aside. What do I need to do? Well, you might want to have a plan. Okay. All right, let's go. And you just jump in and you take over. And there's something about the way that they structured this program, which is all up to them. We don't have to worry about that part. But the doing of it, you were just like, okay. And, and that ability or willingness to just say, okay, is what pulled us all through. You know, Damien, who started, jumped off the bus, private, you know, <laughs> private winners. Right. And three days later, you know, take charge of your platoons. Right. Like, that's how quick it happened. Frank, Even I think so you know the answer, but did you so have a moment? I, I'd know. No, I was so, I knew, it, I was very conscious as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and uh, we all hit walls. There were things we weren't good at or things we didn't want to do, and there's sleep exhaustion and, you know, there's sleep deprivation, and, but no, it, 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 here's the thing, Kirk. No matter what we did, it wouldn't come near what these guys had been through, so everyone knew. You're not complaining, you're not, you're going to get through it, you know, and, um, and we did, and the great thing was, every single person bought in. No one wanted to believe we're actors in a boot camp. For those days, everyone was 100% bought in. And when I'm bought in and you're bought in, and he's, it's, it's infectious, it's, con, you know, it's contagious. And there's just no, there's nothing false about what you're going through. You mentioned when you, everybody hit a wall. What would happen? What happened? How did, how did you climb over that? How did you individually climb over that wall? What got you over it? Peer pressure is one thing. Yeah, like you don't want to let you don't want to let your guys down that that you're responsible for. That's the that was a big we, motivator. But we also bunked together, and we I think they you guys broke it up as uh, platoons and then squads. And you know Rick and I, Rick Gomez is sitting in the front row, played George Les. Um, we were bunk mates. We we're like next to each other, and we had a couple times where you know I'm I, I, I'm the oldest guy in the group. I'm, I'm 35 years old, my kids, I have twins that are three years old, I'm, I'm, I'm an amazing wife, a house, and I got these guys yelling at me, you know, you're a piece of shit! <laughs> and you're like, no, actually I'm doing pretty good. Um, <laughs> on this big mini-series with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. So you have to, you'd have to put all that away and go, you know, and buy, and go, yes, I'm a piece of shit. Like, but I won't be someday, and I'm gonna not be a piece of crap with the rest of the guys, and, and you're gonna help me get there. So there's, an, there's a weird awareness of put that out and, and just commit to it. Um, but, you know, people like, like Rick, who I had met, you know, never knew before, um, we both acted actually in, in some stuff together prior, which we realized. Um, later, but you know, we're, we're just talking to each other, like you know, what? I, I don't know, man. This is this is pretty brutal. I got really bad knees, and Rick's like, "You'll be all right." You know, they'll, 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 they're not going to let you fail. Like, just stick with it. And, and days where he was not feeling great, and I'm like, "It's all right, man. Just have another cigarette. Just you're going to be fine." <laughs> <laughs> Rick. 
Well, and I've, I, in so much of the reading I've done and for, for the, some of the projects we've done is that when in, a wall is inevitable, and we're just talking about boot camp, a wall is inevitable in combat. And inevitably you hear that it's the other guys, excuse me, <coughs> it's, it's your comrades that get you over that wall. Did you guys experience that kind of thing? Oh, for sure. I, th I think there was, uh, uh, the, the heart of my wall was uh, sleep deprivation. There, there was, I think, three nights where they really didn't let us sleep. <laughs> they kept pretending they would, and then they would wake us up. Um, and, uh, and we were in a, a, a dilapidated, uh, burnt out shell of a house, and we were told that the Germans might attack. You know, so be aware, be ready. And it was cold and you know damp and miserable. Uh, we'd marched the night before. We were on guards duty the night before that, and so everyone was just beat up. And I think that was a night where I saw a lot of people just really have that moment of, I got to get through this. And what was incredible was no matter how you felt, the guy next to you, you just took care of. Whether that was you know, you're cold. Here's my gloves. You know. Um, here, tighten up the sleeping bag. This will help you sleep. And somebody did tell me at one point that if 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 you were cold, if you took all your <laughs> took all your uniform off in the sleeping bag and put gloves on your feet, you were gonna be golden. And then I was like, you guys are a bunch of perverts. There's nothing about this that sounds real at all. You're you're gonna make me get out of this sleeping bag in the middle of the night, <laughs> do guard duty and get dressed again. Uh, but it was, it was looking after your, it was looking after your buddy, you know, so there was a lot of that. But I, the, what you're saying, he, he's saying that, you know, they tell you, okay, here's what you're going to do, get naked in your sleeping bag. And then we had been set up so many times by these guys. <laughs> like, that's what was going to happen. So it was told, like, okay, you're going to be fine tonight, you know, everything, you're going to, you're going to get a good night's sleep. We're like, no, we're not. So by the end, we're abusing ourselves. <laughs> These guys don't even have to do anything. They're like, all right, we're going to wake up at, you know, 0600. And you're like, nah, they're not going to bang. They're going to be pounding those pots at 4 a.m. Like, you, you literally got so aware, you know, that, oh, they're going to attack us tonight. No, they're not going to attack us tonight. Yeah, they are. Well, they might. Okay, let's put a couple of guys out front. You just started preparing because of the, 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 the uncertainty of the schedule and what they kept throwing at us, which is exactly what the men went through. Right. And I think another important aspect of it, a captain and I have talked about it, that it was, we're, we're actors in a lot of ways, we're control freaks, we have a process of our own that we like to go through, now that's out the window. And you have no control over anything you do. And that was a big thing for me to get my head around. That was a big, um, that was a big wall for me to get over. That you were just going to do whatever they made you do and at a certain point, it breaks you and you just accept it. But that never knowing what's going to happen is a great state of mind to be in, to be open to new information. Because you're just trying to survive and, and learn what you need to learn. And no one had all the answers. So like some guys couldn't take an M1 apart and put it back together. So you coached them. That made you feel good that you could do that. But you couldn't do the assault course. Or another guy couldn't do something else. So it was immediately sharing the information and helping someone out. And then you started to feel what it was like. I, I don't even expect you to believe it when I say it, but you start to worry more about someone else than yourself, and that's when the good thing starts to happen, and that's when you're changed as a person. Well, which is kind of the definition of love, I think, when you start yeah. worrying about someone more than yourself, but I think it's not too much to say, and we'll get into this more tomorrow, that the, that the, the byproduct of all of this is a genuine love of a kind. Uh, that's certainly easy company demonstrated for over 50 years. Um, I've been asking these guys, I want to hear from you guys back there, from your perspective, because your job is to take on these control freaks, the, you know, these actors with agents. They can just call their agent if they're, if they're getting pissed off at you. I, what was it like and what was the mindset that you had to bring to, to, to meld these guys into a company? Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Marines, and uh, my last four years I was a troop handler at Marine Combat Training, and that was basically my job was to break privates down, put them under so much stress that they can complete combat skills under the most extreme stress. So when I come, you know, 
actor weenies, just like the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> um, and, and, and Captain Di and me, we've done a lot of projects together, and the whole, the whole point of it is it's basically just like the Marine Corps. We spend the first three days, Mike doesn't like it because I'm a little mean for him, but we spend the first three days putting them under as much stress as we possibly can. And I introduce words that they've never heard before. <laughs> Phrases, statement, oh, Captain Di. Don't be so sure of that. Well, yeah, they'll tell you. You know, and Captain Di introduces, not only is he a hard ass, but he also introduces the, the, the intelligence that's in his brain. And, and, you know, and I'm just like the crazy freak. Mike Stokey is like the, the quiet, it's just like a regular Marine unit. And so the first three days, we just try to break their brains down so much that they actually forget about who their friggin' agent is. They forget about anything. They just want to know if I'm going to find him smoking, which I always knew he was smoking. You know, but he didn't know I knew it, but he was looking for what me. Was, what was the penalty? You know, there was none. He's a teddy bear. Yeah. The thing is, he gives you, you know, he scares the shit out of you and really, like, you know, makes you wonder if this is a good idea at all. And I think by day, by the end of the first week, we'd run out of smokes or whatever. And I remember, and, and, and Sergeant Farnsworth was, you know, my sergeant in, in the platoon at that point. So I, I lent on him. And what I loved about the boot camp experience comes back to that love thing that you're talking about. Even though they were beating the snot out of us, and even though they were pushing, they would also be there for you. As a little thing as, I'm out of smokes and I'm cranky as hell. He would come back two hours later and be like, don't tell anybody and give me a pack. You know, I bet he was looking after his boys. And yeah. to me, that was like, uh, we're in good hands. Y you know, I was with Gunny too. He was, so I had the most, all these men are amazing. But I, my, all my contact was basically with Gunny. And, and uh, it was the same thing. I, I got off the bus the first day to approach. And he said, who the hell's Garnier? And I said, I'm Garnier. You know, and he got in my face with that death grill. And he just said, um, I'm on to you. I said, what did I do? I was on a bus. I didn't do anything, you know? And then he just put me through the grill. But what Ross said, about eight days in, he, came, he called me and Kirk Acevedo to his room. He went down to his room, and he gave us a carton of cigarettes. And he said, these are for your men. Give them, give them out. Take care of your men. And that was the big, he was taking care of us to let us take care of the guys we were in charge of. And that was a real turning point like in, in the relationship because he was really starting to train me then as a sergeant because I had been promoted. And like, you, like Mike said, everybody landed on the same day. Like three days later, you know, Damien's got to command the company. Yeah. He knows as much as us, you know. Um, and that was a big turning point. So I, I owe so much to, to Gunny, I really do. And you got me in trouble because I stole those from Captain Day. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cap. <laughs> Where the hell's my cigarettes? <laughs> Laird, do you have any, uh, any particular recollections of, uh, of boot camp? I think, yeah, I got that covered. I think everything's fair play. I guess what was coming to mind was as much pressure that we were putting on the company. We did get a moment, or Freddie and I both, put on Wehrmacht uniforms, and um, so German infantry uniforms, and we're brought into a, uh, this building used for close combat drill of lawnmower. But we were brought into this building as um, prisoners, and we were to be interrogated. And we had already worked with the guys for quite some time. But I had uh, about 15 boots up my behind, uh, stretched, scratched, pulled, kicked, spit on, both Freddie and I, um, as everyone went through a drill to... Uh, to go through what it would be like to get a German prisoner and to uh, what were the steps to interrogate. They did not hold back, none of them, <laughs> none of them. I literally uh, had part of the uniform torn off my body. Um, that was just uh, one of the things that went through my head. So, fair play. But I did own the pizza. <laughs> With the pizzas that you had brought in illegally? I own the pizza. Okay. What? Yeah, he would, no, he was just talking about that. We, we did a night exercise out in the woods, and we were out there for hours, and it was cold, and it was raining. And we went down into these trenches, and we were just waiting for orders, because we knew we were going to be attacked at some point. And we were laying there, and we had, what, 90, about 90 guys in that company. And it's amazing 90 guys could move through the woods without making a sound. Like, we were, we were getting together. We were starting to... Except for the captain who fell into a <laughs> 
And uh, said, we were, follow me. We were, we were laying down, waiting for orders, and it was dead quiet. And all of a sudden, I felt something. And right here was Freddie. And he said, I own the night. And he took off. <laughs> I never saw him come, never saw him go. He was the phantom. That's, that's how he plays. That's it. <laughs> Well, let's talk about some of the practical practical things. I mean, what time did they get you up in the morning? <laughs> well, there's, there's, we laugh about this. There's many stories about boot camp. Like some say boot camp was, you know, five days long. Others say it was three and a half months, you know, and it was somewhere in between. <laughs> it was probably, you know, I don't even know the, the day count. But by my recollection, we were usually up around 5 a.m. Yeah-ish. Um, so 5 a.m. We'd, we'd, we'd be up and at them. Uh, we would go to PT. We would go do physical training. Um, so we would go on, again, this changes, I think, around a three to four mile run. Some people say 12 miles. Some people say five. five. Uh, so we'd go on a run. Uh, then one, you're saying? <laughs> um, we'd come back. We'd have some chow. We'd have some breakfast. Uh, and then we'd drill for, you know, up until lunchtime. And I remember, I remember lunchtime would come and we were starving, hungry. I mean, we're all, you know, a little bit younger than we are now and maybe a little, you know, more in shape. Uh, and we were uh, using all our energy on all these drills and our PT. So come lunchtime, I mean, it was like, give us some food. And the captain would just give us a look. He's like, eat up, boys. <laughs> Enjoy it. You wait till this afternoon. <laughs> and of course, you know, we're going out there with a belly full of food. <laughs> we learned pretty quick to go easy at lunchtime. Well, that was in the show. Yeah. That, that we actually, that was in episode one. You know, one of the, excuse me just a minute, I just, one of the most common questions is what is a typical day in boot camp? There isn't any typical day in boot camp. So much depends on what we have to teach. We had 14 days of which I was able to instruct only about 12. Um, and you had all of that to put into their minds and, and their bodies. It, it, so much of it was muscle memory. They have to know how to do this without thinking about it. Um, and so a day would change. We would begin, the EXO would come to me and say, hey, Skipper, uh, they're screwing this up. And so we would change the schedule around and concentrate on that again. And it, it got to the point where they were training themselves. I would, we would watch them. And I'd say, okay, we need to, like, XO would do combat reloads with you guys in the M1s. And I said, what do we, we just did that. He said, no, they don't have it yet. And we would take them back out to the firing line and start jamming clips into, into an M1. So there was no typical day. Uh, we spotted, we knew, we had a basic framework of what we needed to teach them. And we had it timed out so that we would get everything in, and we never did simply because we had to refocus on something that we knew they needed more instruction on, more practice on. Mike, I think you've got a sort of an outline. Why don't you describe? Yeah, we, here's what we start with, which is the schedule. And uh, there's a lot of notes here because we have to readjust. My, uh, I get anal about reloads. And I just want them to reload, reload, reload. And I kept putting them through these monotonous drills, but they weren't monotonous. Um, what it does is when they're filming and an actor, the clip flies out, he's out of ammunition. He doesn't have to hold up his hand and have the armor come running in. He can immediately reload. Immediate action drills is the same way if you have a jam. They learn it. I remember one episode with Frank Garnier um, he had a Thompson, and uh, that's not an easy uh, uh, machine gun to reload. It's straight in, and he ran out of ammo, and on the move, reloaded that sucker. And it's gold to us, because no director is going to allow time for something like that. So when it happens, it's just perfect. And any veteran in that audience would just, just bolt and sit up. In any case, this is one of the training schedules or manuals that... Uh, Dale and I put together, and there's a lot of scribbles on this because we have to, ad have to adjust things. Um, I forgot my glasses, so uh, this will bring back fond memories. Yeah, Mike, why don't you, why don't you help Mike? Mike, help Mike. Just, just, is that T1 there? Yeah. You can just go down, if you can read it, small. 
type, but at least it's not my handwriting. T1, uh, March, Reveille Barracks routine, uh, 5.30, it's 0600, morning formation, 6.30, physical training, 7.30, assault course, 8 o'clock, secure PT, prep for field work, 8.15, no, scratch that, 8.30, draw weapons, ammo rations, 900, platoon formation, equipment check, 9.30, March, 10.30, cover and concealment, 11 o'clock, individual tactical movement, 12, chow, in the field. Then 1,300, fire and maneuver combat, reload, specializing, uh, focus on units for the medic. Squad tactics, 1,400, 1,600, uh, machine gun drills, movement under cover of fire, 1700 forced march to the barracks area, 1830 chow, 1900 platoon sergeants, we'd have meetings at night, weapons maintenance, uh, 2000 stand down, story of easy company, 2100 guard mount, first platoon, 22 taps. That's a day. And that was the second day of training. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this is fantastic. Where did all this take place? Where did you guys? Where did you guys? Yeah, copy of that. Yeah. Go, go ahead. No, I want a copy of that. I would it was in. It, it it's meant. It and was all in the long notes, more. I, there's notes all over it because things are changing. <sighs> Kirk, did you ask where? Yeah. Yeah. It was in Longmore, um, which, which is where uh, has a long history uh, as an English uh, barracks. At, at the time, it was still being used. I think today it's still being used, and. Um, Part of uh, the units that were training moved off to the side. So we had the obstacle course, or the O course, and we had uh, barracks, and we had part of uh, the mess hall that we used, and we had some grounds. And then, of course, there were fields and forests in the back that, we, that were butt up against some private land, but it was a lot of acreage. Captain, you, you mentioned that it, we've been talking a lot about the, just the, the sheer physical endurance that was required, but you said you had to teach them things, and obviously through the rundown, we, these, some really intricate, unfamiliar maneuvers and, and, and tactical things. Did, was there anything in particular that was d more difficult than others for the guys, you know, something in common, like it, no matter what, we just couldn't get them to do, whether it was reloading the Thompson on the run or whatever it was? I don't think there was anything we asked them to do and showed them how to do that they didn't do. Um, th some with a little more dexterity than others. Um, but w but we, kn we knew it paid off because, and, I, and my cutlets uh, playing Bull Randleman, we had an instance where they were all standing around and there were only two principals that were actually saying words, things like that. And I thought, well, what are they gonna do? Are they just gonna stand there with their finger in their butt like actors? No. And Randleman immediately, I said, he stripped his M1 down and you could see him doing it right there. And the camera wasn't anywhere near him, but it didn't make any difference to him. He was gonna do what a soldier does, which is clean his weapon. I was very proud of him. If, if you get a chance and you're watching the series ever, sort of watch it with the sound off, either figuratively or actually. Just watch the background guys, watch the special ability extras and watch the, the, the cast member who are not necessarily in the scene. Just watch what's happening in the background. All of that actual action, the things that they're doing, everyone is doing something and in action. And that is all a credit to these men that are behind us and cap them up here. Uh, we learned everything from them and we learned how to do it right. And the, the attention to detail that we were forced into and then accepted and then obviously took it further because it, we realized how important it was, was just phenomenal. Uh, again, the, the work that, that the people whose names that you're not always hearing did is amazing. And that's what brings everything alive. The whole, the whole uh, load up of the planes before D-Day, you look at the background, guys, who, you, the, 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 the packing of the gear, the, the way the gear was carried, stowed, strapped down, it, it's incredible. There, there was a moment in boot camp that <clears throat> really solidified it for me. We, we were all uh, buying into this program that Captain and the Cadre put together. We were buying into, okay, we're going to portray these men. So I think individually, we'd all realized we'd, we'd gotten to a moment. But the, the, the moment that just I love dearly 
was um, everybody was taking a little bang, a little knock, a little twist of an ankle or a knee or, or whatever. And nobody was, you know, complaining about it. Uh, I think at one point, Captain did say, if anyone's banged up and hurt, step forward and not one person moved, but everybody was banged up and hurt. Uh, but my favorite moment was I had a little bit, I don't know, stubbed a toe or something stupid. And uh, Shane Taylor, this young man down here, who plays Doc Rowe, um, <laughs> I ended up saying, Doc, Doc, I need your help. And he's like, what's up, Leap? And he comes over. We've been in boot camp for like five days. He's not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> he has no but medical he experience on whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm believing him. And I'm saying, I got, look, look at my ankle, Doc. I mean, he got it, and he's like, all right, Leap, here, put it up. Put your foot up. And he takes my boot off. I don't know if you remember this. And he's like, I need to go get some scissors. I'm like, what the fuck are you need scissors for? <laughs> he runs over, he gets scissors, comes back with a little bandage, and he's like, like, and I believed every single second that he was going to fix my ankle, and he did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. That's when I knew that we were on something that was all working for us. We should talk about Shane, though, because he was in a unique position as a medic. And we, we had another story we were all talking about. We were doing an exercise where we had to advance across a field with machine gun fire over our head. And some special ability expert dived, and he cut himself pretty badly, and he started yelling. And then someone yelled, medic, medic. <laughs> and Shane gets up, and, and Doc takes up and runs over, and they take him off the field. And later, he, every night, he would go through the barracks and see who needed what. If you needed Band-Aids, he would help with our feet. He, would, he was just amazing. And I said to him, he was fixing my foot, and I said, I said, Doc, what the hell did you do? Like, well, you're, well, it's just like what Ross said. Like, what, what were you doing? He said, I helped him. They're, they're training me. Like, this whole other training was going on for, for Doc as a medic that was just, we were so focused on our thing that we didn't. And it's like you said, he was healing. But all through the production, he had that power about him because we just believed, call, call Doc. And if something bad was going to happen, you had to go to the hospital. I want to go with him, you know, because he, he was a brother. He was just, yeah. it was amazing. It was an incredible transformation that we weren't aware of. We're talking about a, mainly boot camp, of course, but this carried on throughout production. I mean, yeah. Dale and his team were there the entire time working with the directors and, and, and uh, other production people. Tell us about that process, you know, Dale, what, what you and your team, how you help production once the camera started rolling. Well, there's a couple of ways that we do it. We, we actually become assistant directors. Um, and, and if the director has seen what you've done, how you've built this unit, then what we do is, I, you know, cut, hit your mark, that's all nonsense. You, first squad, I want you over here about 300 meters and they'd know exactly what to do and go out there and do it. And all you had to do was turn the camera there and, and they were absolutely ready to do it. So that's what we do. Uh, do we watch out for errors? Yeah, but in Band of Brothers, there weren't many. Occasionally we'd catch something, you know, and say, hey, listen, it's really worth doing that again because something happened. But not, not that many times. Uh, they were actually really, really good without any coaching. They just knew what to do and did it. What did it mean to you guys to have these guys as a backstop in that in that area? I, I don't. I don't think it would have. I know it would not have been the series it is had they not trained us the way they trained us. That's just flat out. It, you know, it, it just we owe so much to them that we didn't have to worry about once we started shooting, because our training didn't just stop at boot camp they and captain said this he goes you know boot camp's over your training's not and we would continue to train in between we would train on new equipment that that the company was starting to receive there was certain equipment that they got over the over the course of the war that they had didn't have in the beginning so we didn't have it in the beginning we got it later all right you're going to be retrained on this we don't want you too familiar with this because you guys just started using this Mm -hmm. And then they brought the replacements in, and they're like, these are yours to train. Take care of them. Not too much, but take care of them. So there was this sort of adversarial thing built in that was the same sort of feeling that the, the original Tacoa guys had, uh, you know, with the replacements who came in. Not that they didn't like them, but as they say in the show, they didn't, they were t they were, it became too hard to lose them because they weren't trained the same way they were. 
So that was built into the system as well. The replacements came later. All these guys were available to come to boot camp. He didn't want them there yeah. because they weren't there. You know, in the earlier, oh, go ahead, Frank, and I'll, uh, earlier session, Rick had mentioned what it was like when Bill had to leave. At one point, Bill Garnier is wounded at Bastogne, and all of a sudden he's gone. And that cohesion, that emotional cohesion that you guys had was just kind of stripped away because unexpect, well, we knew what was in the script, but all of a sudden you're not, you're not expecting it, and you're gone. Kirk is gone. Kirk Acevedo is gone. What was that like for you guys? I mean, after, I mean, Rick had mentioned, and I thought it was really telling this morning. He said it was, and then you, the rep, you're replaced by somebody, I don't know you. I don't know you at all. And the last, the last thing I shot was the sequence with my leg. So literally the last thing I shot was them carrying me away, telling Joe, I told you I beat you back to the States. And I'm telling you, two days later, I was on a plane home. And that, that was a shock, you know, like to know everybody was over there still shooting. And uh, it was tough. It was, it was really tough for me. And from our side, there was a huge hole. There was a huge hole when any of the Tacoa men, any of the boot camp guys. Uh, but early on, even when we were, you know, certain characters, episode three, um, you know, certain characters were, were no longer going to continue in the show. It was a real, uh, you were losing a brother. And so what was, again, a wonderful stroke by the cadre was really implementing that strong bond between the guys. So when replacements were coming in, they were replacing the likes of Bill. And that was just a no-go to us. You know, it was, our, it was our brotherhood. What do you mean? You know, in a human way and as an actor, you're going, of course, you're going to welcome somebody in. But it was a real hard boundary to uh, allow somebody to get in close. Right. Um, do you have any particular, is there something that stands out? We talked about some of the things that stood out from production, I mean, from boot camp. But what about during the production experience along these lines? A particularly difficult physical thing that you had to do that you did do because you were so well trained? Was there something that you, there, was there an aha moment when you're in production and you just said, oh, now I know, now I know why he asked us to do that? I think everybody probably had their own individual moments where they were like, oh, okay, this is, this is why we did that, or oh, I, I see what they did, you know, or, or thank goodness we went through this or that. But there was, for me, there was this, um, there was this moment during filming when we were shooting the dike, when all of us were there. Um, we, they did this sequence where the cameras were, there was probably four or five cameras, and there, were, there was a camera tracking back and forth going up and down the line, and they were just basically filming us firing. And you know, clips were pinging, and we were reloading, and we were jamming, and we were doing everything on camera. And we were literally being soldiers in that moment that, that you, could, you could smell you know, the, the gunpowder in the air, you, could, you got hot iron, hot brass down the back of your neck, um, you know, next guy next to you was out of ammo, you were handing him out, like, we were just doing these things that we were trained to do that had nothing to do with what was written in the scripts necessarily. The, the specificness of that wasn't written in there. What we, were, we were told to do that. You're, you're, you come up to the line and you fire. But all the little interactions in between and the reloading and the, the jamming and, and, and soldiering, I was like, oh my gosh, we, like, we're getting the tiniest taste, the tiniest taste of what these men went through. And for me, it's a moment I'll, I'll never forget. And guys are dropping when you're firing at them. The Germans, you know, there's 300 Germans coming over the hill. And they're li you're like, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you, you, you shoot at a plane, bang, bang, you know, and what if that thing was to blow up? Right. That's what it felt like. You're like, oh, oh, did I, what the hell just happened? Frank, I, I had a thing like that. I forget which episode it was, but we had a sequence where we were, it was uh, maybe f end of five or six, but... We were, on, we were dug in on a line, and we had been setting this shot up with multiple cameras all day. And it's been talked about a little bit, but we never saw the German soldiers. They were, they were trained. We never laid eyes on them, except when they were attacking or we were attacking them. We never met these guys. We never had a coffee with these guys. We never spoke to them. And you're we you're welcome. What? <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we were dug in, and as the anticipation was building about this sequence that we were going to do, you didn't want to be the guy who was screwing it up in any way. And 
the tension was mounting, and after hours, it was finally roll sound. And we looked into these with action, and it was dead silent. And then you'd hear, you'd hear metal grinding, and you would look 200 yards across this field, and tanks would come out with Germans running in their snow uniforms, running at you. And Kirk, I'm telling you, it fools your mind. The way it, like a game of paintball can, you know, can, can fool your mind. This was paintball on steroids, you know? And, um, and you never felt so small as when three tanks are pointing at you and firing. And then when they fire, all the trees explode over your head that have been all set up days before you've gotten there. It fools your brain into thinking and the panic of just reloading and firing, nothing's gonna happen but you don't know that at the time, you know, and you know you're on camera and you're just trying to fix everything. It was a really intense experience. It was, it was incredible. Ross, do you have a... Yeah, I guess a moment for me, um, uh, you know, it's sort of going back to what you said just before, it was a mutual respect, I think, between us as actors and the cadre. There, there, was, a, um, there was an understanding once we'd finished boot camp and, and once we'd started shooting that Captain could look at us and say, hey, Lee, I need you to you know, do this while the director's doing it. Yeah, got it, you know, and it was just, it was quick, it was eye movements, it was hand gestures. It was, I need you to, you know, make this happen, dive in that hole head first, go, you know? Um, and there was a moment, I forget what episode, it might have been Tom's episode, it might have been episode five too, um, and it was with me and Rick uh, uh, playing Luz, and um, I don't know if you remember this, Rick, but you, you had the, uh, the radio pack on. And we had to come down the side of the dike, and it was a night shoot. I don't know if you remember, Captain. And uh, on one of the takes, we went down, and there was a stumble, and the radio pack came off halfway up the dike, and we both, like, end up at the bottom. And we're rolling, you know, and realistically, we should just leave that and continue on with the scene. But we ran back up, grabbed the radio pack, because that's what you would do. And I remember just afterwards, Captain came over, and he went, that's easy company. That's it. That's what you do. It's those little things that go wrong and you know how to fix it. And I went, wow. That was your Medal of Honor. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about, and we can never forget, you were, you were playing real men who did all of this stuff for real. Um, when you were having some of this, this tough time and you were relying on the training, was part of what was going on in your mind, even though you, your mind is tricking you, you know. There's part of you to know that you're still just pretending. Was there ever a time when those kinds of things happened when you did reflect that somebody actually had to do this, actually had to perform under these circumstances, and much, much worse, of course? All the time. Uh, all the time. All the time. constant. And when you would do a maneuvers, you would just say, I don't know how anybody comes home from this alive, if, this was, if these were live rounds. There's so much chaos, even no matter how. Just trying to move your, your line up at night is... You know, you, you move the line up, and then, like, when the lights come on, there's four new guys that you, they're not your line. You're separated, and you're scattered, and it's, um, but they, Easy Company, didn't have a second take. If you screwed it up then, that was the end. You are going home in a box, you know. So I think we all thought about that all the time. And it helps when trees are exploding around you, and, you know, before you do a take, uh, you know, the effects team will come up and say, okay, listen, that flag there, that flag, these are all the explosions, all right? And then they remove them. And you're like... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and the, yeah, and, and they set it up. Um, a lot of what we shot, um, no matter what direction you looked, you, you were on the set. You know, there's a lot of times we go to work where you're, you know, here's our set, and you turn around, and there's 300 people drinking coffee in the sound stage. You know, it's like... For the most part, all the outdoor stuff was set in, you know, in, in sets that they, the art department had built, the, the production design, and it was phenomenal. Um, you know, just England itself was an amazing character with the weather. It was always, just, just the weather was just, just terrible. I mean, just, <laughs> just from, a, and that's not a judgment, it's a, it's a fact. <laughs> it's like, is it, it's not, is it going to rain, it's when is it going to rain? And, and all of that just felt, you know, it fed into to being, you know, immersed in there. So, again, as Frank was saying, you, 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 you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I, I get the littlest bit of it. But, you know, these guys didn't get to, if you trip, get, get up and do it again. 
and you're, all, you're constantly reminded, we're reminding each other that we had a responsibility to the men. We also had a responsibility to the captain and these guys because that was our immediate thing of who we didn't want to let down and they built that into the system as well, which also pushed us to be better. I know we'll get into this more tomorrow as well with you guys, you're all on panels, but um, how much did you, in, in preparing, talking about training and the, the mental aspect of it, how much and how did you, how did you learn about Bull? How did you learn about Joe? How did you learn about, you, you were lucky, well you two were lucky, you got to meet your characters, but what else did you do to really try to embody these men? I mean, I've, uh, I've, I'm going to repeat myself in front of the guys here, but I remember when um, uh, everyone got like a dossier, uh, or files upon files about the man that they were going to portray. Uh, and I remember getting a manila envelope and I was, I was slightly jealous at one point because I was looking around and these guys had files of information. And I had a manila envelope with one picture. And that picture was the same picture in the book. So it wasn't really like, you know, anything new that I was going to... Um, and I was like, okay, how do I get my how do I get my head around this? And this is pre-internet, you know. So uh, I'm down the library doing crazy stuff like learning a paratrooper song. <laughs> I know I'm never going to use it, but I wanted that information. Uh, I wanted to know how these guys walked and dressed and held themselves in in, in those times. But the beauty, uh, which is where I actually was fortunate, was these uh, these men never or rarely talk about themselves, but they'll happily talk about their buddy. So that was my way in. So I knew I could lean on the real Garnier. I knew I could lean on any of the gents. I'd get them on the phone and say, can, can you talk to me about Joe? Absolutely. And they would give me just vital information. So that's how I learned was through, through the men. And that was so important to me to see that it was just such a selfless act from these gents. They don't want to tell you their story. They don't want to tell you that they're the heroes. They want to talk about their buddy who's a hero, you know? Frank. Um, yeah. They, um, I, the, the, the night before the final audition, I, um, I, had, I had gotten Bill's number and I called him. I told him I may be playing you. I have an audition, you know, for it. It's the final audition. He said, that's not going to happen. They already got the guy. <laughs> I said, oh, really? They got the guy? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I met him. He's a good, you met him? Like, I was... <laughs> Um, so I said, well, look, if I'm going to go to the audition anyway, and, uh, if I get it, I want to take you out to dinner. He said, all right, kid, it's not going to happen. But I said, so, uh, I said, any advice? And he said, just remember, I was a 19 year old paid killer. Anything else? <laughs> That's good, sir. You know, I hung up and then the next day I got it. He was shocked. I got <laughs> and, uh, and then I just called him. I, again, I was so lucky that I had a living vet and I had Wild Bill. I mean, that was, that, was, that was the equivalent of seven living vets. Like, he had so much information. And to his, I called him every day or three, four times a week, and we talk on the phone for hours. And to his credit, he was just as fearless in sharing his experience, things he hadn't been talking to people about for a very long time. He was just as fearless sharing that, which was not of his generation to do, as he was fighting the war. And he just knew this is getting made, I'm gonna dump everything I can to help him tell the story, to get it right for every other man in the company but him. Like he would not talk about himself. So I would do the same thing. I would call Carwood Lipton. Mr. Lipton, what he talked for hours about everything that Bill did. When I talked to Bill, he sounded like he was there delivering coffee. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I was there, I did that. And I, he wouldn't talk about it, but the other men would. To the point, I like to tell the story that from, from my last episode when Bill gets hit, I talked to Carwood and I said, you were there, what was, it, you know, what was going on? Because I was always fact-checked in the script, you know? You, were, you just want to see if there was Smart any little... Man. Any little... De no, was, they were brilliantly written, but I just wanted to find if there was any billism I could put to it. And he said to me, Frank, I, I want to tell you something. He said, Bill's leg was, was flapping when it happened. He was in control. He, had his, he was very present. He wasn't screaming. But his leg was moving, and then he got quiet, and Mr. Lipton started to cry. And I said... Sir, I can let you go. You've given me, he says, no, no, no. I, you gotta get this right. 
And then he tapped on the phone. He said, this is the tempo his leg was flapping. And he, he went on the phone like this. You know, and that's what I used. That's what they were willing to give you. That was the power of having the veterans to, to draw from. And then I had Babe, who was his best friend. And Babe was the same thing. He would just love to talk about Bill. And Bill and Babe were kind of like one guy to me. They were, they were so, you know, they were so sharing of each other. Yeah. So I was very, very fortunate, you know, very fortunate. Mike? Uh, I was fortunate as well. Um, Denver was still with us when we did the series. Um, didn't get a lot from him early on because he, he just didn't talk a lot. He was just, he was honestly just a man of very few words. But I did get a lot from uh, the other men. Uh, Lester Hashi was was incredibly um, generous with his time and his information. Um, his wife Vera was amazing. I think the first time I talked to him, you know, it's, it's, we all had uh, for all of us who had our our veteran that was still with us. You have that moment where you're going to call, and you, you, for me, it was a couple of rehearsals of what am I going to say, and then a couple of dialing the number except the last number a couple of times. Because <laughs> what do you say? Hey, I'm the guy who's going to play you in the movie <laughs> to an actual World War II hero. Um, it's, it's surreal. Uh, but I finally talked to him, and I think the first conversation I had with him was uh, about four minutes. And it consisted of, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, what do you say? Tell me about the war. Like, it's the, everything comes out of your mouth is dumb. There's just no way to ask a good question of, as an opener. So, you, you know, you say, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll call you, um, is it okay if I call you back in a, you know, a week or two and we can chat again? Uh-huh. <laughs> and then he says, would you like to talk to Vera? I say goodbye to Vera. I said, I'd, I'd love to. And then I proceeded to talk to her for an hour and a half. <laughs> and I got more from her and from his friends and from the people who knew him than I did actually from him, except how he presented himself as himself. The information I got from everybody else is how they saw him, which is more than you need uh, as an actor. So I think that as long as people knew who these men were, all of the men had things to draw from, from the people who knew them. And those are things that you could play because we're, we're not who we think we are. We are how other people see us. That's just the fact of it. Um, so I think we were all given a gift to be able to talk to any of these men or their families. Uh, or anyone that knew them. Um, and it, again, I think it's uh, the end product speaks for itself. We're very, very proud of the project, and we are very honored to be a part of these men's lives and legacies. As we're winding down, um, this is great, and it's, it's all very public for obvious reasons, but this is still your 20th reunion. And I, w I would like to ask, Captain Die, this is your reunion. Is there anything you'd like to say to these guys on your 20th reunion of B Band of Brothers? Yeah, they're, you know, they taught me, uh, or they reinforced in me, the concept of love, uh, which coming from an old soldier is, is a hard concept to probably wrap your head around. But I knew that I had them. And I knew that they understood when I started seeing the things that you've heard Ross and Michael and Frank talk about. Um, when they were helping each other, you could see that they understood the concept of brotherly love. And they really understood. They probably couldn't have articulated it, but that wasn't the point. The point was they reinforced in me that that concept is there and it's valid. And and people can understand it. And it's one of the things I think Band of Brothers has brought uh, to the huge fan base that we've got here in the States and, and, uh, and overseas. They see that love. And that's a, boy, if you, can, if you can tap into that once in your life, if you can do that, you've really gotten something special. You got a special look at humanity. And that's what these guys brought to me and to Mike, Freddie Joe, and Laird. They reinforced that we were right to do this. And so, and, and that if we do it correctly, with the right people, 
they could just knock it out of the ballpark. So what I would say to them simply is this. I love you, and you're great. Thank you. And this is your 20th anniversary of, of your, re this is your reunion 20th anniversary. What would you like to say to Captain Die? Hey, you want to follow that one, huh? That was, <laughs> sorry. Where's Jenderson? I need some pages. Let's get some, get some script. Um, I, I would, I would, I'll, who wants to jump in? You? You? Um, you just have to take it back a little more to everyone at Playtone, everyone, you know, Steven, Tom, Ivan, you, Tony, and Meg, which we'll have time to talk about Meg. Um, these people didn't cast a show for me. This, it sounds, but these are my friends. They've casted my friends for life. You take that and you put it under the pressure that Captain Die and the Cadre did, and you have a once in a lifetime forming of friendships that nothing else can create. There are people in our families we haven't had these experiences with. Um, so it was just a once in a lifetime unique thing that built these friendships that are 20 years old and will be 50 years old. Um, and I would say we could not have been the friends we are. Forget the actors or the soldiers we were on in a movie. We couldn't be the friends we were without you doing what you did, without you doing what you did, without you doing, and Freddie, and, and Meg putting us all together. It was, that's was, that was the life-changing aspect for me, that it was more than a show. When I watch that show, I'm watching home movies. I'm watching our friendships begin, you know? So it's that personal, and it doesn't get better that way. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Frank sort of summed it up, but, but to me, captain knows this i mean you know he and i have a, a great relationship I, I love him with all my heart um same as freddie joe and i are close i don't see this guy enough and i don't see this guy enough but um to go through what we went through to have the fear of god put in us by these men um to witness what they achieved is the reason not the only reason but a really big reason why the show is as successful as it is, is because of what these gents did. Uh, and it's what Frank's saying, I have uh, not just friends, I have brothers, real brothers, that um, we talk three times a week now, 20 years later. You know, there's, there's movies I did five years ago, I don't see anybody. Um, uh, and it, th that's been put together by this amazing program that the captain and the cadre did. They, they, beat us up and they built us up uh, and dare I say turned us into the men that we are. Um, and the legacy of Banner Brothers, knowing how important that was um, to retain this story, to be a part of that uh, and to just, they just told us how important it was. And, and for that, look, we've, we've, we've all been together now through births of kids, marriages, relationships, divorces, you know, we're all gonna be together until the end, this, you know. And, and, and with that, I know Captain has put together his, he, he says it all the time, they're my kids. And we feel that same way about him, and we feel that same way about everybody else. Great, thank you. Mike? Yeah, they summed it up. Uh, my, my kid would call this a moonshot this whole experience. So thank you, sir, for the moonshot. <laughs> One more thing. I just want to say before we wrap up, there's three of us here. We're just a bunch of NCOs representing a company. Just like in every scene that Mike talked about, whoever's in the scene, the whole company's in the scene. If it's two guys in a scene, you can feel the company. And we've got, all our brothers are here, and we're just up here, but we speak for them. They all have these stories, and we're no more special than anybody else. It's just, right. we're telling the story for the company. Yes, of course. And, and a lot of you guys are going to get their opportunity, a lot of the guys here are going to get their opportunity to be up on stage tomorrow. 
and hear different other sides of, of this entire story. So I hope as many of you as possible are going to be with us all day tomorrow. So until then, thank you very much. Thank you.